Well, good morning. Lovely to have you with us. My name's Nick Williams. I'm vicar here at Christchurch, and we are continuing our series this week on the theme of transforming generosity. And in our diocese, uh, we have called it Generous October. And this morning, uh, Bishop Andrew, the Bishop of Guildford, is going to be continuing our series. Let me begin, though, with uh, Psalm 8. It's a wonderful psalm of praise and worship. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honour. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths and of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's pray. Faithful one whose word is life, come with saving power to free our praise, inspire our prayer and shape our lives. For the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, it's lovely to have uh, Richard King leading our worship this morning. So over to Richard. Well, thank you, Nick. Uh, it's lovely to be uh, with you all once again. My name is Richard King. I'm a member of the uh, church family here, and I will be uh, helping to lead us in our worship uh, this morning. A couple of words of thanks to start with. First of all, to uh, my uh, two uh, sons, uh, Charlie and Tom, who've helped with the recordings. And secondly, I'm delighted to say that uh, Linda will be uh, joining the singing in our second and third songs uh, of today. So as we come to our first uh, opening song, there must be more than this, uh, let us just pause and prepare ourselves to worship our Lord. Abandoned to 
Great, thank you so much, Richard. I love that song by Tim Hughes. Well, as you know, uh, we've had a change in the office and it's been great to welcome Helen Fraser as our new operations manager. So I took some time earlier this week just to chat to her and find out a little bit more about her. Well, it's great to be able to officially welcome Helen Fraser to our church as our new operations manager. And uh, we are here in the Canterbury room, socially distanced. And I thought it'd be a great opportunity just to ask Helen a few questions. So Helen, uh, maybe we would begin with just tell us a little bit about yourself. So I grew up um, in Greater London, North East London, lived there for the first 18 years of my life. Um, I have an older sister and a younger brother and I studied chemistry at the University of Birmingham and then for the next uh, few years I was working for three um, corporate companies, uh, one of them travelling uh, internationally and my family have gone to a well-known Anglican church in Woodford Green for a long time, um, All Saints Woodford Wells and I was part of the uh, Sunday school and um, youth group there and um, helped out with script union camps and uh, yes, so that was the beginning. Fantastic. And I know um, if you fast forward, you've just come back from 16 years in Egypt, which is a long way from Woodford Green. Yeah. So uh, what have you been doing out there and who have you been working for? So in 2002, um, I felt a calling uh, that came over a number of years um, to serve in the Middle East. And it started through uh, visiting Israel, actually, in 1996. And I pursued that calling with a mission pastor in, in the church. And he had also served out in Sudan um, and Egypt. And there was an opening to serve with Bishop Nir in the Anglican Church there so that was the link that was made initially as uh, working in the bishop's office so there are similarities with the role that i'm doing it was a very uh, busy uh, situation with lots of people lots of visitors dealing with all the correspondence that was in english and then he had on his heart very early on when i was there to set up a school of theology and uh, he felt i had the administrative skills uh, to support uh, the work that was going on. So in 2005 we set up a school of theology and um, I was then moved into a development role because my background was in sales and marketing and they had a need for fundraising. And uh, so I was involved in um, finding the money really for the college which was based in Alexandria in Cairo initially and then subsequently we sent up um, another site, campus in Upper Egypt, uh, for all Indigenous um, students. Yeah. Fantastic. I mean, I love the way that your journey in Egypt went from sort of one role to, a, to another. Mm -hmm. But what brought you back to Guildford and to Christchurch? Well, I always wondered when I was going to come back. Many people asked me, and obviously my family really missed me when I was out there. And uh, over the last three years, actually, I've had to come back. I was a CMS mission partner, and they were very kind at certain times. I came back for about seven weeks stints um, over the last three years uh, because my parents were taken into hospital. Um, and my brother and sister had very um, high-powered jobs in the city. And although they could obviously go and visit, they couldn't sort of stay overnight and things. So I came back on three sit times, and they're now in their 80s. And um, I just felt really it was now time as people in the School of Theology had also moved on, people who had started working with me at the very beginning, now are moving on to do PhDs and come back to become Indigenous faculty. And yeah, times and seasons change. And um, I tested it at the end of last year. I came back for two months um, and served at Lee Abbey. Um, in administration on the desk in the Beacon Centre, if any of you have been there, which is for the youth in the activities. And um, yes, I had a house in Guildford that I'd let and miraculously the tenants were going to be moving out, which enabled me to move back in. And here you are uh, at Christchurch. Indeed. That's, that's great. And you've been working in the office for two weeks alongside yes. uh, Louise, doing a bit of a handover. How have you found those first two weeks and what can we be praying for you? 
what I love about this role is that it's very, very diverse um, and I enjoy meeting a wide variety of people. I've had that experience all my working life. Um, so that's one of the things I think I'm really going to enjoy about the role. Um, and also the multifaceted nature in terms of um, the administration, but also the operations and the actual functionality of the church. Um, there's an awful lot that I still need to um, get much deeper into and get my, my feet really wet. Um, but yeah, I think I'm going to have the support with the people that are here and really enjoy being with everybody. And Louise has been a great help. Fantastic, and you will get support. I mean, it's a it's an interesting time to take on a new role when uh, you don't have the opportunity to meet all the all the church family. Uh, but we will pray for you. So maybe one or two things that would be really helpful for us to pray for uh, for you in particular. Yes, one of the main things I felt moving into this role was also it was God's way of integrating me into back into Guildford really, after 17 years, it's almost a generation. Um, though I still have some friends here that uh, are still around, obviously similar age to myself or maybe a little bit older, but a way of being back into the community. So I think just to be really bedded down into the community in Guildford and naturally, obviously, to really um, to be of service uh, to, to the church and the work that I'm doing and the people who are part of it. So just to be really connected with all the different networks that we have and to encourage more people to be a part of it. Fantastic. Well, let's, let's pray now. Mm. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your call on Helen's life. We uh, thank you for leading her, Lord, uh, throughout her life for her ministry with CMS out in uh, Egypt and Lord, for calling her back here and for just the things falling into place. And we just mm. pray your blessing upon her as she settles into this role and feels part of our church family. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Great, I hope you'll make Helen feel uh, very welcome here and part of our church family very quickly. Well, we're going to turn to confession now, an opportunity for us to look back and uh, just come before God with open and honest hearts, recognising that we haven't always lived up to God's standards. So please respond in the words that are in bold. Lord, when we avoid the hard questions that you ask, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Jesus, when we fail to trust you for our futures, Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, when we cling too tightly to our possessions, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins and keep us in eternal life. Amen. Well, this morning we're thinking about the story of the rich ruler. Well, we're just going to uh, watch a short uh, video clip. It's called Paul and Karen's Story. And after that, we'll have our Bible reading and then Bishop Andrew will speak. 30 years ago, um, my brother and myself owned a frozen food company. And uh, we really thought we'd made it when we got a letter from the uh, merchant bank saying, welcome to the Millionaires Club. So in working terms, we'd really made it. We had achieved everything that we'd set out to do, really. But there was this big gap with inside me. I wasn't at peace, I wasn't happy. And uh, it was there that I started a journey, really. I started a journey of searching. So we had become accustomed to a lifestyle. We were living in a lovely big house with a lovely big garden, and we had had lovely holidays and nice cars. We shopped in Harrods, and ski holidays and all sorts of things and it was at this point actually when we became Christians and it was at that point when Jesus said to me can you give up everything for me can you be like my disciples and walk down the road and go on a journey with me take nothing with you and I will provide as you go 
and I sensed deep within my heart that there was going to be a real change in our lifestyle. And we didn't quite know what changes were going to take place. But actually what happened over the next seven years was a complete stripping away of everything we had. He made it abundantly clear that unless he blessed it, we could earn nothing. And he took us to a place where, where we'd been very, going from being very capable of running businesses and earning money to a place where whatever we did, we could do nothing. It was uh, uh, after those, at the end of those seven years that uh, we really looked at our lives and said we're still not doing what we want. We've found an inner peace, but we haven't found an inner peace in work. And it was then that the Lord uh, sort of told us to give up complete work and to go into full-time ministry. During this time, we have become increasingly aware of the needs of people around us and I saw especially huge needs in people that I longed to see met in Jesus. And so we really sought Jesus to, to understand him more and to know how to share him with the lives that we saw around us. Going back to the beginning, uh, we've we found that inner peace. We've found a security and an inner peace that we were striving for so much in our own strength. I think uh, for myself, I, I found that God is just so generous. Just that God is just so generous. He gives so much. I thought I had to strive for it, and He just pours it in. He just pours it in. I would say the biggest difference between where we are now and where we were is that instead of building our own kingdom, which is what we were doing, we are now seeking to build the kingdom of God. We're not saying that everybody has to give up their home and their wealth and their lifestyle like we did. For us, that was very important for God to teach us the lessons that we needed to learn. And I would just say it's really important for people to discover what God wants them to do with their life and where they are for the whole fruitfulness of the kingdom of God. A certain teacher asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honour your father and mother. All these I've kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who can then be saved? Jesus replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God. Peter said to him, We've left all we had to follow you. And truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, No one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. Hello everyone and as we look together at the story of Jesus' encounter with the rich young ruler, may the words of my lips and the meditation of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord our strong rock and our redeemer. Amen. The man had it all. He was young, he was wealthy, he was spiritually minded, he was a ruler, a leader in the local synagogue. He was every mother's ideal son-in-law, the most eligible bachelor of his day. Assuming that he's the same man that we read about in Mark's Gospel in a similar story, we're told that when Jesus saw him, he loved him. 
There was something about this man's spiritual searching, his longing for the kingdom of God, that touched Jesus at the deepest level. It's not often that the gospel speaks specifically about Jesus loving an individual. In fact, we can count those occasions on the fingers of just one hand. We read of John the Apostle, of Jesus' favourite little family in Bethany, Mary, Martha and Lazarus, and then of this man. And it wasn't just Jesus, I'm sure the disciples, when they saw this man coming out of the crowd, felt honoured to usher him into Jesus' presence. Such a nice change from those backbiting Pharisees and teachers of the law on the one hand, and those rather dodgy tax collectors and sinners on the other, not to mention those annoying little children from whom the disciples had just been trying to protect their master. It's strange how Jesus had behaved on that occasion. He'd taken the infants in his arms and said how the kingdom of God belonged to such as these. The disciples really hadn't begun to get their heads around the implications of what he meant. But now, what a relief to have such a straightforward case standing in front of them. A man of such great standing, of moral stature, who'd obeyed all the commandments from his youth, and who'd been rewarded with great wealth, much like the spiritual heroes of old, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, David and Solomon. Now, wouldn't it be extraordinary to have this man both backing and bankrolling Team Jesus? And perhaps the rich young ruler saw it quicker than Jesus' disciples did. Perhaps he was still chewing over Jesus' words about infants, those with no status, with no power, with no wealth, inheriting the kingdom of God. And wondering what that meant for him, who was quite the reverse, a man of high status, considerable power, remarkable wealth. So did he predict the bombshell before it finally erupted? We don't know, but he didn't have long to wait. There is still one thing lacking, said Jesus. Sell all that you own and distribute the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. It's amongst the toughest teaching that Jesus ever gave on the subject of wealth, not least because it wasn't theoretical, it was deeply personal, a lived out example of what it meant when he'd earlier taught that you can't serve God and mammon. And yet it's teaching that explicitly emerged, not from a place of unkindness towards the man or criticism about how he got his wealth or envy or some kind of proto-communism, but from a place of love. To mention those five once again, there's the Apostle John, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and this rich young man. What do we do with status, with power, with wealth, if we have them? And in global terms, many of us do have them, even though it doesn't always feel like it. How do we resist the dark tentacles of mammon, which so easily begin to squeeze the Holy Spirit out of us, robbing us of a true dependence on God as our provider and of the milk of human kindness in our hearts for those in need? Those are a couple of questions at stake here. And a third is this, what does it mean to be part of the family of Jesus? Not just our nuclear family for whom we care instinctively, but part of the family of Jesus. This new community of Christian brothers and sisters, parents, grandparents, children, grandchildren, our local church particularly, and yes, the global church too, where human status and power and wealth don't impress anyone, at least, they shouldn't impress anyone. And where our net worth is defined not by the number of noughts on our bank statements, but by the depth of our generosity and the quality of our character. The Jews had a number of ways to address those questions, the most famous of which was tithing, giving away the first tenth of your income to the poor and to the work of the priests. And Beverly and I are among thousands of others in our diocese who adopted that principle from an early age, tithing our pocket money even before we knew each other, then our student grants, our salaries and stipends for more than 40 years. And all that I can say is that it works and God has richly blessed us through it 
and hopefully blessed many hundreds of others too. To adapt the words of a famous advertising slogan, giving is good for you. But what happens if status and power and wealth really go to our heads? What if mammon and what mammon buys us has become an addiction, an obsession, if my only real concern is me and my closest, nearest and dearest, the nuclear family gathered around me? The word possession, after all, cuts both ways. To begin with, I may have possessions. I possess them and they belong to me. But all too easily, a quiet power shift begins to take place so that gradually I become possessed by my possessions. I belong to them. My identity is somehow tied up in what I have and my life focused on an endless quest to get just a little more. So back to this rich young man, and I suspect that that was what was going on here. That here was a case of possession, of addiction. Indeed, Jesus' response to him was very little different from the teaching of the 12 Steps programme of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And when the man walked sadly away, because Luke tells us that he was very rich, Jesus didn't run after him and offer him a deal. I didn't really mean it. He didn't say, let's, let's agree on 50%. No, the surgery he'd suggested was radical, but it was just what this man needed. It's hard, responded Jesus, for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And why is it so hard? Because in and of ourselves, many of us are powerless to prevent possessions from possessing us. And just as the disciples tried to swallow the implications of that, especially given their theology that wealth signified the blessing of God, Jesus concluded with those famous words, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Now these past few months have been a really challenging time for us all, for our hospitals, for our care homes, for our schools, for our businesses, for our churches, and especially for the poor in our nation and around the world, many of whom have faced lockdown in unpleasant and cramped conditions, who've been disproportionately affected and hit by the coronavirus itself, and who are already bearing the brunt of redundancies and unemployment. Our church finances have been hugely stretched in the midst of it all, particularly those parishes that depend on rental incomes that haven't been coming in and weekly collections to make ends meet. And meanwhile, the churches have often been at the forefront of amazing community initiatives to provide for those who are most vulnerable or financially challenged in our society. And that's not to mention an extraordinary flowering of online worship too, and 101 creative ways to meet the spiritual needs of a nation in shock. An uncertain time like this can have two effects on people. Either we can live fearfully, tightening our grip on what we have, or rather in terms of today's reading, allowing what we have to tighten our grip, its grip on us out of a desire to maintain as much control and security as we possibly can in the midst of such uncertain times. Or else we can live faithfully, opening our hands in generosity and compassion, out of recognition that the church family and the spiritually and financially poor whom we serve may well need some of our resources a whole lot more than we do. Speaking personally, I've ministered on council estates in the West Midlands and affluent communities in trendy Notting Hill. And almost invariably, it's been the poorer communities who have given the most, certainly in terms of proportions, far more than the wealthier ones. And yet I've also seen wealthy individuals open their hands in extraordinary generosity. One man, for example, who was writing a cheque to the church and who unexpectedly and joyfully found himself 
adding three noughts at the end, and so releasing the extraordinary ministry among prisoners in Wormwood Scrubs, because with God, all things are possible. Some of us will have been financially hit by COVID. Some of us may even have benefited, saving money on train travel perhaps, or pricey holidays that have had to be postponed or cancelled. And perhaps this month, generous October, as it's been dubbed, gives us an opportunity to reflect on our lives and our ambitions and our spiritual and our financial priorities. To reflect on what it means to be part of the family of God and not just to cosset my nearest and dearest. And to respond to the challenge of Jesus to open our hearts afresh in service of the one who so radically opened his heart to us. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, as the Apostle Paul once put it, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Amen.
Well, lots of challenging words from Bishop Andrew this morning, lots to uh, think and pray through. And I love that song that we've just had. Thank you so much, uh, Richard. It's one we've sung here before, not very often, uh, but again, just beautiful words which really speak uh, to our hearts. Well, we're going to turn to prayer now and Claire Twiggeross is going to lead us in our prayers today. Let us pray. Lord, you call us to live generously with our time, our gifts and our money. Show us how to practice generosity every day in all our thoughts and actions. Loving Lord, we see so much need around the world, inequalities increased by COVID, other crises forgotten. We pray especially today for the ongoing crisis in Syria, for all those whose lives have been torn apart by war and who now face food shortages, unemployment and COVID. We pray that those with power and influence will have compassion and wisdom, that their hearts will be generous so that the country can start back on a road to recovery. We know you are there, Lord, with those who are mourning, who are suffering. May they see your face and know your love and peace, even in the darkest times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Lord, on this anti-slavery day, we call to you with hearts in pain for all our world who suffer the horrors of modern slavery. For all who dream of a better life in another place, only to be trapped, tricked and traded. For all those who labour, forced and unseen, to make our everyday possessions. For all who agonise for loved ones lost to this trade in humans. Your Son came to bring good news to the poor and the oppressed. May we too be voices against oppression, channels of good news. May our eyes be opened wide to all those who suffer in our midst but out of sight. All this we pray to you, loving God, for whom no one is invisible. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Lord, we give thanks for Nick and all the leadership team here at Christchurch for their hard work, creativity and helping us to continue to worship you in new ways. We thank you especially for Owen, for his commitment and care for the young people in our church, how he is nurturing and developing their faith. We thank you for Louise as she finishes her job in the office, for her kindness, generosity and support to all of us over the past months. We pray for Helen as she joins the team. Help us all to welcome her into the church family. Strengthen, sustain and encourage all the team in all of their work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Lord, we pray for all those who are suffering, for whom this day will seem long and hard for those in hospital or ill at home who are going through times of trouble. Be close today to the lonely, the bereaved, the despairing and the desperate. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in mind, body and spirit, especially those known to us. We bring all those known to us who are suffering before you now, Lord, in a few moments of silence. Give them courage and hope and let your love surround them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Lord, we are in need of strength. As we look forward, many of us are feeling worried by what the next few months may bring. With talk of new lockdowns, increased cases of COVID. More than ever, we look to you for our hope and strength. You show us the way to cope in difficult times. You give us gifts to use. 
by taking delight in the everyday, looking after each other and our neighbours, practising generosity and kindness in all our actions and creating new ways of connecting and sharing, we can bring hope to others. Lord, we pray that we will honour you and use our gifts to make a difference in the coming weeks and months. Merciful Father, accept these prayers in the name of our Saviour, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We bring our prayers together today by praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, say that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my light Be thou my wisdom And thou my true word I ever with thee And thou with me, Lord Thou my great Father And I thou this live on Sunday morning. We uh, have a virtual coffee at 11 o'clock. Do join us. Great opportunity to catch up with the church family. And then tonight we are back in church. I'm so excited about this for our 6pm service. Just a reminder that if you haven't been to a service yet back in church, uh, then that you will need to wear a mask and uh, you will need to sort of hand sanitise and keep social distancing uh, when you enter the building. But really looking forward to being back tonight, six till seven in church for our informal worship. Well, let's say a final prayer. May the Holy Spirit who gives gifts to all people flood your hearts with thanksgiving to God. 
And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the risen Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. And we're going to finish our service by listening to a piece of music sung by Chris Munray. Make my life a prayer to you. I'll do what you want me to. No empty words, no white lies, no token prayers, no compromise. I want to shine the light you gave through your Son you gave to save us. From our despair, it comforts me to know you're really there. I want to thank you now for being patient with me Oh, it's so hard to see When my eyes are on me I guess I'll have to trust And just believe what you'll say Oh, you're coming again Coming to take me away So you can give your life to me So I might live Share the hope you gave to me The love that set me free I wanna tell the world out there You're not some fable or fairy tale That I've made up inside my head you're God the Son, you've risen from the dead. I wanna thank you now for being patient with me. Oh, it's so hard to see when my eyes are on me. I guess I'll have to trust and just believe what you say. Oh, you're coming again, coming to take me away. I wanna die so you can give your life to me So I might live Share the hope you gave to me Share the love that set me free